Hello and welcome to Identity Leather Craft. We're going to look at lining leathers and just a few examples and a few tips for how to go about it. So for this exercise we're really looking at the concept of bonding uh, leathers together um, or it could be fabric to leather for example. Uh, so the reason you might want to line leathers, you might want to provide a backing to cover up over um, some r the rough back of leather or where there's marks or just to give a really m nice finish and professional finish to the back. Sometimes you'll see it on dog collars, so the front collar will be the thicker leather and the back will be a really nice soft leather that's um, going to give a little bit of padding and support. Um, you might see it on the back of a coaster with, um, you might use it for knot and slip, for example, putting some felt or some um, suede onto the coaster. Uh, so you can use it for those sort of properties. We did a bushcraft knife sheath for the bushcraft magazine and that was lined with chamois leather. So the idea being that the moisture content of the leather would of the moisture is any if the blade was damp when it went in would be wicked away from the metal and as you pulled the blade out it would be polished as well by using the chamois properties so there are lots of reasons you might line you might be trying to hide a magnet um, or a bag class fixing you might be trying to protect a screen like on a phone or a tablet uh, so how would you go about it there are lots of leathers you can use so you can use something basically that's kind of thinner so this is um, some of our really lovely tactile sheepskin napper leathers it comes in a variety of colors I've got the bright colors here just to show some of the examples but we also do it in some really lovely natural shades and like a cognac and a, um, some lovely shades of browns deep deep intense colors um, they have quite a nice finished surface uh, so there's not a lot else you need to do and they've got a really good softness to them so these would be suitable uh, you can also use suede so suede would have the anti-slip properties it's really good for lining jewelry boxes um, it's good for anything like glasses cases where you want that kind of slight polish and slight resistance um, to things so uh, this this is a, our one of our soft pig suedes and again it comes in about 34 different colors there's a nice olive there's bright colours, all sorts. Um, we have metallic leathers too, which would be suitable for lining if you really want to go quite jazzy. And if you want to stick to veg tan and you're putting veg tan to veg tan, um, we have some thin leathers. So these would be um, calf. Um, this one here is 0.8 of a mil. So it's got a lovely kind of soft thinness. Uh, this one is slightly thicker. This is from our one mil calf. Um, piece and you can buy this in as little as four square foot um, or you could get some of our leather pieces from our pack of our lightweight veg tan pieces uh, which is a very economical way to buy these leathers and if you're looking to back or line small projects phone cases those kind of things small sheaths uh, then this could be a good way to go and would certainly save you money these leathers are all available from our website www.identityleathercraft.com The main thing to consider when you're lining your leather is what the implication will be for the edges of what you're doing. Uh, you can do different methods um, to sort this out. So it could be that uh, you glue the leather down, in the case of this one, trim it off, which if I do that now, cutting quite close to the leather, getting a nice clean edge. I've got a new blade in my precision craft knife and I get an edge that's finished and neat and trimmed from when I've gone down. So I just call this the straight clean edge. I'm doing that and I'm doing a thicker veg tan on top so for example if this was a collar or a belt I would finish this edges first 
um, so that this and I when I do that I would just be beveling on the top not both sides because I don't want to get it rounded and have the lining stick away so I want the lining to be bonded onto more of a right angle um, so I would bevel the top and slick my leather get my leather prepared with a stitch line because whenever we line leathers it's a bit of a belt and braces approach uh, you glue and then stick down so I tend to make my finished edge my holes ready before I go anywhere near putting my lining on and if I was dyeing or tooling or anything else I'd get all of those actions done um, so that the, almost the last thing I do then is to put my lining on and the reason for this is that if you get any glue or anything on the top um, it's going to resist your dye going in um, and you also you don't want to get any of your dye or your mixtures onto your lining that you're putting on unless you're deliberately doing everything all in one go um, by lining in the same way so that would give you a finished edge with just that very thin leather showing as the if you like a raw edge if you very lightly put another wax on and be very careful when you're slicking rather than giving it a good slick with the channel just give it a burnish from that top bit to just seal that top over but this this thin leather is just about the cut really for that edge so another method you could do would be to take the lining around and over the edge. So if I turn... So if I turn that, that's where the lining is on this little sample. So I've turned it and glued it down on that front edge and then it's been saddle stitched into place. Okay, so that gives you like a piped edge and that can be nice to give a contrast. It can hide any of your raw edges and save you doing any other edge treatments. The trick with this one is that you'll need to get be quite precise when you're lining up. So on your reverse side of your leather, you want to draw yourself a line. So you're positioning your leather up, folding it. Probably the easiest thing is to cut your leather bigger than you need. Place your item down, glue it in place, and then trim. And you want to allow about 10 millimeters, um, especially if you're working with a thicker leather, so that you've got enough leather to go round on that curve and then come down to give you about a six mil overlap here. Um, so that you can put your seam allowance in for your stitching. Okay, if you're using that example, you would then put your stitch holes in at this end phase and stitch together once they're bonded together. So that's like a uh, edged over method. Uh, the other method you could do would be to put, um, make the lining into a piping. And this can be a really nice feature, particularly for the top of a bag. Um, so I'm just using bits of string that I have um, around and it's nice to kind of think of the diameter of the string to be the thickness of the leather that you're working to so that when it sits on the top again that edge is hidden so if I was to this is one I've uh, I would draw a line on and glue in place and fold this over and when this is folded over as this example here is done I would get my bone folder and really press this in while it's still while the glue's still wet so that I'm pushing and butting all of that glue up around that piping to get a nice tight height look. Now when you come to stick this one down onto your item here you're going to need to rough this section of leather if you've used nappa. If you've used suede it will, won't matter um, but because this is a nappa leather this top layer here is quite shiny um, and it's going to resist the glue a bit you're not going to get such a good key and you won't get such good adhesion and then you might find your piping is coming away so to do that uh, you can either use um, some sandpaper and carefully do it I prefer sometimes to rough with the tip of my knife because it means I can make sure I don't get any scratches into my piping so I just literally kind of flake away at it of creating crisscrosses and just really raising the surface of that leather. So 
So this means when I next go to put the glue in, that's going to really give me some good adhesion. And I can then glue that lining, press it down into place and push it up against that edge and you get a nice contrast piped edge which you can then stitch into place. So if you can imagine that's either a, a, a belt edge with maybe two bits of piping either side or it makes a really nice um, finish for the top of a bag like a tote bag. Um, so as an example of it here you can imagine that being on the top of a bag with a contrast colour. So you could do that if you want to do that and keep that as veg tan. If you use the 0.8mm calf leather, that will give you a veg tan version of the piping. So that would be how to create a piped method. Uh, the other method is what I would call the fold over method. So this method would leave you, instead of having a raw edge on this side here, uh, you can have that leather so that you see a fold. So you would fold the leather over, so I've marked my line, I would glue that down into place and then when I come to put it onto my lining again I would rough up that fold over so that that section there is all roughed up. You place that down ready, glue in position, ready to stitch and that's going to give you that sort of look to your edge. So again, if you're using this method, you would want to have this edge finished um, with however you're going to finish it with your edge coat. Um, and again, just doing the beveling on the top side so that this lining leather is neat but meets just like that. And this is a really nice method to use for particularly things like belts and dog collars. You get quite a nice kind of look to the top finish rather than that cut edge. You get kind of a nicer kind of soft edge, if you like, on that back lining. The trick is just really to make sure that your sizes, because the leather can stretch a little, that all of your measurements are going to work out correct for when you place down that you get a nice finish to the back. So there we go. So you just want to do some working out of that before you would go and before you can then stitch. So gluing. So, and that method you can also use same method if you're using fabric to stop it fraying so you would glue that edge over like so fold it over and glue there with this method I would be tempted with fabric to use maybe an upholstery spray glue over it rather than using the P you can use these PVAs but what you don't want is for them to seep through and you get kind of marks on the front of your fabric uh, so we'll carry on as if we're using it on the basis of using these leathers here. So we'll get a piece to bond down. So I'm taking a piece that's bigger than the piece I want to do and I want to add some glue on. So I'm going to use um, Phoebing's Leathercraft cement. Uh, you could equally use um, Eco Weld, the Leather Weld. Um, if you wanted uh, to have something where it's going to, if there's going to be a lot of flex or movement, you might want to use the contact cement, uh, contact adhesive, which will be on both sides. The advantage of that being is that if you've got your glue spread out on one side, but you've got a s tiny area where you've missed a tiny bit, um, when you go to this side, the likelihood when you put those two together. Uh, that that's not going to happen you're going to they're going to sort of make contact with no missing areas um, but here's a little method for using these glues and hopefully not getting any missed areas so again what we want is kind of less and is more so I always work by gluing my lining first um, so my lining is where the glue goes on to um, what I would normally do is to lay out my pattern piece and my lining is cut bigger. I think you should be able to see that. So I would, with my pen, just give a little mark in a few places around where my glue frame, inner frame, needs to be. So 
but I've just literally given myself just a rough idea of where the glue is going to go down to. I've got a clean sheet of paper here and I poured my glue into a container here um, to make it easier. One of the best things to use to do this is the glue spreaders which we have on the website. They're the red glue spreaders that will probably remind you of your primary school. <laughs> um, but they're really excellent for this sort of thing. Um, I've managed to lose mine so for the purposes of this I'm using a piece of plastic which is a spreader that came with a lampshade kit that I bought. So I have some on the tips and starting from the centre I'm going to push this down. You could probably make one of these out of a cut piece of yogurt pot or something. And the advantage of using a spreader rather than putting the glue on as a brush is that you're, you want to not have any real big liquid patches um, on the leather. And also this way you can take things right close to all the edges and work the leather over to make sure that there's no uh, liquid pockets of glue. What you want is a really thin even spread that's gone over all of those fibres. Um, so this gives you a really good way of just checking and making. If you hold it up to the light you can generally see um, areas where there's not so much and you want to really pay attention to all those edges and the corners. And this is a, because this is not a contact glue, this glue can be used, um, you can go straight away without uh, waiting for it to um, go tacky. Um, so it's kind of already going a little bit clear in these conditions. You can probably just see there's no great big bobbles of it, it's fairly evenly over. Um, and the reason for doing that is when you next put your top piece down, you don't want to have any glue kind of squirting out through the sides. Um, you can, if it does happen, keep a real close eye, wipe them off with a little wet, keep a damp um, kitchen bud handy. Um, but if you've got the glue spread and fairly thin, you can avoid that happening. And anything that avoids any kind of contamination going onto your leather is going to be um, helpful to you. So then I'm going to put my little piece of leather down. I'm going to start at one end and just press it and press it really firmly into place. And what I'm going to then do, making sure I've got no glue on my piece underneath or moving it aside or finding a clean piece, I'm going to turn it over And from the back here, I'm just going to really carefully, holding my finger in the centre, just use the edge of the bone folder. A poly roller tool is really good for this. Maybe a rolling pin, but if you're doing a really big area. And working from the centre out to each of the edges, I'm just going to put some pressure on it. What I want to do here is to get those fibres to bond, but also to push any air out that's between them so I don't get any pockets forming. And if there's any kind of stretch going on in the leather at this point, by working from the centre to the edges, you can get that nice and smooth and finished. Once you've done that, you've got a wider piece. Um, in this case, this is one I'm going to trim round. Um, and I'm going to leave that, I would leave it for 24 hours to cure off before I do anything else. The glue itself can drop, be dry within a couple of hours and you can go to work on it but if you imagine that you're going to go and trim and cut this away and the glue is still a little bit tacky or not quite dry, um, any drag of the knife is going to start to pull it um, away. So it's often better to wait until that's all glued and finished and then go and you can then do your trimming away. Um, and that's another reason why I like to put my um, channel holes and my stitch holes in beforehand because again if I'm going to chisel um, when the glue is still a little damp or anything like that um, I've got a danger of everything pulling up and you're putting a lot of pressure onto to it. So although I don't have holes in the back here I will remedy this once it's dry using a diamond stitch hole um, or diamond stitching all and putting that onto um, one of my mats I will then go through the existing holes you can angle the diamond to the diamond shape and push through and mark 
make your holes for the reverse. And once you've made those holes, you can then saddle stitch as you normally would. And that will attach your lining, belt and braces, a nice smooth lining, a nice smooth finish. Um, and again, if you wanted to, you could then, depending what you want to do with the edges, but with this example, you would trim, trim them all away. Okay, so if you are doing it with the piping, leave those edges a little bit bigger, allowing for the piping. Once it's all glued on and it's, it's got its stretch, then cut your line so that your line is nice and, and straight that's going to fold over so that you get a straight line here looking attractive and without any wiggles or anything like that. So if you do it once you've already glued and um, you'll be able to get that line straight whereas if you pre-cut it unless you've lined it up perfectly and you've got any kind of stretch from putting the back lining on you may end up with a slightly uneven line here which is kind of annoying because this is now on your front of your leather piece. So I hope that helps, that's kind of some tips on lining leather, what glues to use, what leathers are suitable. Um, in terms of edging, if you are using uh, a, the firm calf for example and you're lining that one, you might then want to use the leading edge system uh, rather than trying to slip, you're obviously going to be working then with two chrome leathers which won't um, edge in the same way. So that method works really well for just creating that seal across the top when you've got layers of leather. Um, so as I say, I hope that helps. Um, if you've got any ideas or you've used any of these to make your piping or anything like that, I'd love to see the examples. Um, and you can get all the supplies and materials from www.identityleathercraft.com. Thank you for watching.